Welcome to Houston Sports Talk with your host, Robert Land. Thanks for checking into the best Houston sports podcast, now part of the Believe Network. And joining me is my co-host, Stephen Kerr, 65 plus years in sports journalism between the two of us. And later in the show, Joe Espada's Blender of the Week <laughs> and an underrated loss in the Texans organization, plus Bill O'Brien says dumb stuff on a podcast. But, what? But, Steve, <laughs> but uh, Stephen, I, I did want to announce my <clears throat> dream Rockets pick if they stick at number three, and that's coming up not too long from now. All right. Well, we definitely are looking forward to that. I mean, there's so many different scenarios that we could use with that and that whole number three pick and we've talked about. So, uh, yeah, we'll definitely get into that. Yeah, the draft is just uh, less than three weeks away, actually. And, and, you know, when I watch the playoffs, I see three huge elements that lead to winning size, shooting, and high IQ. Unfortunately, nobody in this draft fits all those elements. <laughs> As you know, not a great draft. The best you can do for size, Donovan Klingon. He's not bad as far as IQ, but since it'll be difficult to play Klingon much with the Rockets' best player right now, Shangun, I'm taking the most elite shooting prospect, Reed Shepard, who's also high in IQ. He opens up spacing for Shangun, which is a big benefit. He's shown range well beyond the college level three, which is big for me. 52% from three in a 30 game, around a 30 game sample size is too hard to ignore. Plus, I remember the question marks about Steph Curry's size coming into the NBA. Not saying he's Steph, but I just don't want to be, Stephen, the one who passes up an elite shooter when you have a roster full of young guys with questionable shooting. And Stephen, another consideration is even if Jalen falls on his face, Shepard's a perfect fit next to Amen Thompson in the backcourt since Amen's size makes up for Shepard and Shepard's shooting makes up for Amen's range. Yeah, you know, I was just thinking that when you said it. And, you know, it's kind of like the old Meatloaf song, two out of three ain't bad. You know, he, he may not have sure. the size, but he's got the other two things. And I think the more I think about what this Rockets roster needs, Robert, in a, in a draft like this, and the fact that they have the number three pick, the more I keep coming back to shooting. Because, to, to, you know, shooting and defense, obviously, you know, defense was the big thing, too, last year. I think Ime Odoka has shored that up to a, a much greater extent. You know, they did rise in many of the rankings as far as defensive stats. But the shooting to me is really where it is that the Rockets, and, and for sure, Reed Shepard is, is the guy that everybody talks about, keeps coming back to, if you're talking about the best shooter in this draft. Yeah, and we remember Jabari Smith had a really great shooting year at Auburn, and then he sloughed off when he came into the NBA, and now we're right. like, oh, is he is he good, or is he just kind of mediocre shooter? Can he get back to what we thought he could be at Auburn? But it's a big difference when you're shooting 40% from three and then you've got a Reed Shepard that's shot more than 50%. And I'm also factoring in the Calipari's Kentucky guards have often looked much better in the NBA than they appeared at Kentucky. Shepard's amazing off on numbers at Kentucky, his sort of plus minus have to at least be factored in too. And I love having Shepard being tutored Stephen by Van Vliet, who plays a similar game defensively and in a draft where nobody appears to have superstar upside. Why not take a player with a super elite skill like shooting? Yeah, and that's one of the biggest reasons the Rockets, you know, wanted Van Vliet is for his veteran leadership. And, you know, at that point, it was the young guys that they have now. But if you're going to draft somebody at number three and bring him in and put him in that position, who better to do that than Van Vliet? He'll be sticking around, you know, at least another year to be able to do that and maybe pass some things along. And Stephen, I, I just got to send also a quick congrats to Rudy T because – not a whole lot going on with the Rockets these days, but he won the National Basketball Coaches Association Chuck Daly Lifetime Achievement Award. And it meant enough to him where, you know, he talked about tearing up and, yeah. you know, you could just by reading the quotes from him. I mean, I, I think it meant a tremendous amount. I, and I'll put a link to our recent Rudy T tribute at the end of this video in case you missed it. Because, Stephen, I, I, I just I, I think it's cool that Rudy is not forgotten. And, and I'm just thrilled, really thrilled that the Space City Network is re-airing the 94 Rockets-Knicks finals right now. Oh, I know. I, and unfortunately, I don't get that, so I don't get to see that. So I bet that is a really cool thing. And you know what? Couldn't have happened to a better person and a, a better guy than Rudy. And I, I don't think I'd get any argument from that. You know, the interesting thing about Rudy T and Chuck Daly, they have a couple of things in common, Robert. They both won back-to-back -back NBA championships, and they both coached the U.S. team. So it's kind of interesting that, you know, he would win the Chuck Daly Award, you know, and then there's a couple of similarities between the two guys. You know, and Chuck Daly certainly one of the best coaches ever in the NBA. But, you know, I think we, we forget that 
both of them, you know, actually went outside and coached the U.S. team. Steven, this Chuck Daly Award goes back to 09. It's not been around all that long. It's amazing how many ex-Rockets coaches have received it. Rick Adelman, Bill Fitch, and Del Harris, along with Rudy in just the last 15 years. And, you know, we didn't even mention in our Rudy tribute, and, and I'll take the hit on this one, that he ranks fourth in playoff games coached and playoff wins all time and fifth in playoff win percentage of head coaches with 20 or more playoff games coached. So, I mean, Rudy's like an elite playoff guy. <laughs> he is very underrated when you're talking about that, Robert. I mean, most people, let's be honest, they're not going to mention him, and they should. Because, you know, those stats, as you said, speak for themselves. And, you know, that is a lifetime achievement award. So, you know, it's not necessarily going to a current coach. It's going to people that have coached in the past, you know, that are still around the game in some capacity, maybe. So, man, I just I lit up when I saw that Rudy T won that award because certainly deserving of it. And for, for so many reasons, I keep asking our viewers on YouTube. I want you guys to post in the comments. Who do you guys think the Rockets should pick at number three? Um, I've got some responses so far, but I, the more that come in, I, it's kind of fun to see who everybody yeah. likes. But I remember I put that question, I posted on on Twitter on X, and Reed Shepard was the consensus. And I, I just feel like Rockets fans are going to be d very disappointed, Stephen, if it's not Reed Shepard at this point. Yeah, I think so. And either that or they're just going to trade it and maybe get a piece. This is one of the things that's going to be so intriguing, Robert. And we still have, what, almost three weeks? So we're going to have to sit and wait a little bit longer. The suspense is probably going to kill us by the time it's, it gets there. But what are the Rockets going to do with that third pick? All right, let's go to uh, the other team in Houston that's on the upswing. We're going to get to that other team. And the team that's on the downswing, yeah. Not, we'll set so, it for later. <laughs> not so upward a little bit later, yeah. But uh, it's going to fly into the radar. But the Texans lost an important member in their hierarchy. The commanders grabbed director of team development, Dylan Thompson. I know a lot of you out there go, well, that's, that's no big deal. Why do I care about that? Well, it matters to some important Texans because CJ Stroud said, quote, there's a ton of great people in this organization, but DT has been the main person. You talk about a brother, like to somebody who loves you, no matter what happens on the field, you can feel that he's really one of the reasons why I feel like we were very successful this year. That's CJ Stroud talking about him. And Will Anderson said, there's no Will Anderson without Thompson. He had a mm -hmm. huge impact on the rookie class, taught them how to be great leaders, help them with spirit, spirituality. And uh, Stephen, I'll, I'll just say this guy sounds like Jack Easterby without the ego or power grab elements. <laughs> oh, let's yeah, let's definitely hope not. And you know what? Fans don't usually know about the people in the player development department because they're typically, they're not in the press conferences. Y you'll see write-ups about them, you know, or, or have them quoted, like say, after the draft, when they're assessing the draft picks. But otherwise, you don't really hear from them. But that by no means, that, that does not mean that they aren't valuable. Because, yeah, without them, how are you going to know who's, who to draft, you know, who to pick? These are the guys that bring those players to you in the scouting department. They work closely together. So losing someone like that, they're, they're losing a valuable member. And, Robert, you know it's because of the success the Texans had this past year. And if it keeps going, if they equal what they did next season or even surpass it, you're going to see more guys like this leave for better front office jobs or even coaching jobs for that matter. Yeah. And the brain drain has mattered with the Astros and hopefully uh, it's not yeah. going to take the toll on the Texans, but that's what happens when you, you are successful. And don't know if you heard about this, Steven, speaking of uh, a guy that the Texans lost, but not a guy that anybody <laughs> said that the Texans lost. Bill O'Brien was on a podcast a few days ago. Did you hear about this? No, I did not hear Bill O'Brien on a podcast. Yeah. Are you sure you got that right? Yeah, he was on a podcast. <laughs> he was on there with with Christian Hackenberg, who was his quarterback at Penn State. Oh, okay, that figures. And, and right. there was a uh, I forget who the host was, but he said a couple of things Bill did that made me chuckle. Number one, O'Brien said he didn't enjoy being the GM, didn't enjoy negotiating contracts, and more or less said it was a mistake. Well, I'm glad he's aware of all that. But quick aside on contract negotiation. Hey, Bill, remember when you hired? No, I'm sorry, you didn't hire him. You fired Texans longtime great negotiator Chris Olson. You you had a negotiator, if you did like to do it, that was really good at his job and you let him walk. You told him to walk. And what really made me chuckle, Stephen, is when he said he was in charge with, quote, another guy. He would not even name check Easterby. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's funny because he certainly defended him over and over when he was there. You know, the only thing, Robert, that 
surprises me about that is the fact that he would even say those things on a podcast. Because as you remember, if you watch Bill O'Brien in his press conferences, after a while, after a short while, you could almost quote, you, you could almost know word for word what he was going to say. I mean, it, it was about as predictable and as as dry as a, as a sponge. So the fact that he's saying all this stuff, you know, it, it's kind of interesting. And I, I mean, I guess because his former quarterback was on, maybe that was maybe that was the reason. But, you know, there are always going to be things that come out after somebody leaves. I'm glad he admitted it was a mistake, although it doesn't sound like he said it was my mistake. So he stopped short of that. But it certainly he was the one who wanted all this power. So when he got it, he said he suddenly realized maybe this is what not quite what I'm cut out for. And, you know. Cal McNair is like an overriding dictator and said, no, Bill O'Brien, I don't care if you don't want to be the GM. I don't care if you don't think it's a good idea. I don't care if you don't like it. You got to be the GM. He was held up at gunpoint, Stephen, and made to be the GM. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right if you believe that, I've got a, a bridge to sell you in in here in Austin where I live, because it's just not true. I don't think, I don't believe that for a minute. Ah, it's just, it's ridiculous. And then he, it also made me laugh when he said that uh, he can coach <laughs> he said he could coach, which he was fine, not great, but he was patting himself on the back as a coach. Let's just put it that way. But after that, he says he can evaluate talent, quote unquote, and then went on to pat himself on the back for the Laramie Tunsil trade. He called Tunsil one of the great left tackles in the history of the game. Now, Stephen, Tunsil's good, but he's never been all pro. I mean, <laughs> all all time history of the game. Come on, Bill. Yeah, I think like that's stretching it a bit, you know, but if you have to admit at the time, he certainly is what the Texans need. I mean, they desperately needed a left tackle, but to say that you're going to put Tunsil in the top five of all time offensive linemen, you know, I, yeah, yeah, I, I, I don't say think top so. five, but he just said, you know, he just said he was an all timer, which is to me, yeah. I was like, what is he? I was like, Larry Tunsil's got to make an all pro before he's an all time guy. Well, if you're saying all timer, he's a top something, whether it's top five, top 10, and he's on a top list somewhere. So, but yeah, the, the fact that the Texans needed a left tackle. I think underscores more why they needed Laramie Tunsil than the fact that Laramie Tunsil was just this great, you know, top five left tackle. Yeah, he might be top five or ten in the NFL now, but he's not of all time. But not on. all time. No, I don't yeah, think so. Yeah, he's he's not a Hall of Famer even yet. You know, the he's way being it's, paid like one. Yeah, but I mean, not, I not necessarily is one. Yeah, I think he's far from a Hall of Fame, like a easy Hall of Fame candidate right now. And uh, Bill talked about evaluation, and I mean, is an evaluation knowing that you don't need to give up two first round picks? and a second for a left tackle. I mean, Steven, talent evaluators don't do that, which is basically a quarterback type trade for a left tackle. And they don't make, oh yeah, there's that DeAndre Hopkins deal. Anybody remember that one? The worst maybe in NFL history. Mm, how could you forget? So, well, you know, it's a matter of opinion and Bill obviously has a high opinion of himself. So once again, I, I don't think that's really surprising that he would say that sort of thing. Yeah. I don't know what's going on at Brown university, but I, if I'm the people over at Brown, I'm trying to figure out how do can we erase him from our record books somehow? Yeah, no. yeah. And Brown's a listen. Brown's a top academic school, so you know what? Can, what more can we say? Uh, is, is it still after having Bill O'Brien on top? Well, I, yeah, I was I was trying to leave that out. I was trying not to knock the school too much, you know. But it's, but yeah, you could say that. All right, now a quick plug for an upcoming show that we've got. Without giving away the name, I'll tell you to look for one of the top four or five wide receivers in Houston's NFL history. He was a first team all pro went to three pro bowls and a key guy. And what I'll call the greatest ever Houston NFL wide receiving course. See if you can figure out who we got lined up. I'm excited mm, about this one. Uh, you've got sure. me wondering, Robert. Wow. All right. Let's, uh, let's move over to the can't hold a late inning lead Astros, Steven, and <laughs> two more gut wrenching losses in the last couple of days. I'm laughing, trying not to cry, but Social media wants to harp on Ryan Presley's bad luck, but geez, it's, it's, what is it like five blown saves and three, two or three blown holds or something like that by a, a setup guy that used to be one of the best closers in the game. Yeah. It's been going on too long, Robert. And I don't know. I, I had this dreadful feeling or feeling of dread, I should say. And I know, I think I talked about it on this podcast that when the Astros signed Josh Hader and that meant that Ryan Presley was going to be, you could use the word relegated, I guess, to a setup role I just had this uneasy feeling that it that he was not going to have a good season that no matter what he said publicly and no matter what the team said publicly that it was going to affect his performance and man I, you know there are times you wish you were wrong Robert you know that's one of these times because he has just not had a good season and 
who knows whether that is the reason or whether he was just due for a bad season. But whatever the case, yeah, it's gone on way too long for it to just be, oh, Presley's just running into some bad luck. I mean, the whole Astros team has been dealing with this all season. I just feel like, okay, yeah, there, there's an element of expected batting average and expected this and whatever. But at some point, I mean, we watch the game, Stephen. You just you get the feeling it's going to come unraveled if Presley comes in the game and it's close. And I've read that, well, now he's not great, got great numbers when it's a back-to-back -back appearance or when he's had a long time off. So now we're supposed to, what, pitch him like every other day or something? I, it's, it's, it's getting too complicated for a guy that's just supposed to be a, a dominant guy. And, and to fall off the map, and yeah, his numbers – you know, trailed off a little bit last year, but it, it feels like he fell off a cleat. He fell off the Jose Abreu cliff. <laughs> How many blown saves did you say he had? Five, I believe it's five. Like you now. said five, I think, right? The Astros are five and 14 in one run games. That tells a lot. And and I think you even said uh, it was either this last podcast, I think we were talking about how many one run games they've lost. And the fact of the matter is, if you lose that many one run games, something's going wrong. And I'm sure a number of those were due to those blown saves by Presley that you were talking about. It, it just, it, it points to, you know, there's usually, if you're losing one run games like this, it's the little things, but those little things add up. And that is definitely one of them. And it's actually become a big thing if you're talking about Ryan Presley. If Ryan Presley does his job, Stephen, <laughs> they're in the race. They're right there. Yeah. And the funny thing is, I know, what are they, seven games out as we're recording this? They're not exactly out of it, but they're they're taking themselves out of it every day that something like this happens, whether it's the last game of the Angel series, the opening game of the San Francisco series, you know, games you, you could have had, but you let slip away. And each day that goes by, you know, once we get through June, Robert, I think we're going to have a pretty good idea of whether the Astros are going to win this division or even make the playoffs, depending on what happens in about the next three weeks or so. I don't know. I'll talk about it a little bit later, but I feel like um, my, my hope is just about <laughs> run out <laughs> at this point. Um, but let's get to, um, Another thought that I had, and, and it kind of leads me into my Espada blunder of the week, because Sunday's loss, I don't think that was all on Presley. Not sure what you thought, Stephen, but when Presley gives up the run to make it seven to six, you got to go to Hater. I know he's trying to save Hater for the ninth, but it was obvious Presley didn't have it. Worry about the ninth if you get there, and if you're willing to bring in Hater in the eighth and pitch him in the ninth anyway in a tie game, which is what Espada did, then use the hook on Presley sooner. He hasn't been shy about doing that before. Hey, haters come into the eighth inning, and, you know, that was talked about before the season, that he probably wouldn't do that well. He's done that on numerous occasions of this season, and it didn't pay off. Yeah, you you had the game in hand, and you let it get away. You know, I'm trying so hard to give Joe Espada the benefit of the doubt, Robert. I really <laughs> am. But as the days go by, I'm beginning to wonder about – some of his pitching decisions. And that's one of them that, that definitely goes up there. It's a head scratching one because aren't you in the point of the season now, Stephen, where they need to start treating these games like playoff games, because if you don't get back in soon, it's over with. Well, absolutely. That's, that's why I'm saying, I think June is a critical month to find out where this Astros team is going to be when you get into September and October. And if they're, you know, 11, 12 games out by the time the month ends, I don't think you can have confidence that they can even come back. And if you, if you're not going to win the AL West, chances are you're not going to make the playoffs with any of the other wild card spots because your record is going to be poor. Just to put the cherry on top of the Presley deal, it it's six save opportunities for Presley, one save. Six save opportunities, mm. one save. That is yeah, that that's is not good. Terrible, and and they're hitting three eleven against him, and it's a one six four whip. And I mean, bad luck, whatever. It's no, it's 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 bad pitching at this point. It's bad. Well, pitching. it's bad pitching, and you know, Robert, so much of pitching, as you know, is is mental. And I I just think it's it may have even started out that way when the season began because of his role being changed. Now, I, I think it's just mental as much from a performance standpoint as anything else. And you're allowed to demote him. He's, you know what, Ryan Presley, I'm sorry, you're not doing your job. Just like he's moving guys up and down the batting order a spot is, you got to move Presley up and down priorities. And, you know, Seth Martinez might need to be the guy in the seventh inning with the Brayu in the eighth inning at this point. Well, you know, that's interesting you bring that up because I thought the same thing. And, you know, your batting order, if, if it's not immune to making changes, well, neither is your pitching staff especially if it's in the relief situation. You know, if he's blowing too many more, I don't know that you can put him in leverage situations. Whereas a guy like Seth Martinez, who is pitching, I think, better than we expected, why not give him a shot in that role? I mean, you can't do much worse, right? No, and I, I'm curious, just 
on a spot of Stephen, you, you, you said it, it's starting to, the, the, the flaws are starting to show. Is there anything else that you saw this week that bothered you? Were you happy about Jose Abreu coming up to bat against the Giants late in the game with two guys on? I was going to, that was what I was going to bring up. And look, I know we're picking on Abreu. It, it seems like we're picking on Abreu all the time. And in this case, it, it's not really that. It, I mean, it's not Abreu directly, but putting Abreu in that situation when he has struggled so much. Yeah, I know he's had a couple home runs. I mean, he, he kind of looks like he's putting things together, but I just don't think now is the time to put him in that spot. I, that's where I think he should have been pitch hit for is, is in that particular spot. And, you know, you had runners on base and I, I think he struck out if I'm not mistaken. I know he left the runners on base. So yeah, I'm not sure I would have put him in that situation just yet. The Abreu situation is worth picking on because this is the exact epitome of what has gone wrong with the Astros. Bad investments, dumb decisions, the emphasis on, oh, we've got to double down on a bad decision instead of, hey, we're the Astros. We're winners. Yeah. Screw it. This guy can't do the job. We go to the next guy. That's what winners do. That's what the Astros used to be about for seven years. Yeah, I think we even talked about that last week. And, and that's what it is, is they're they're just trying as hard as they possibly can to help this guy turn around. And listen, nobody wants Jose Abreu to turn around more than I do. Maybe not more than Jose Abreu, perhaps. Because if he turns around, that definitely makes the Astros a better team and gives them a better chance to come back. But, you know, we're seeing little snatches here and little snatches there. But it's going to have to happen more before I'm going to say, OK, maybe that stint, the month stint in Florida did him some good. But Right now, I'm just not convinced. And if you brought up Joey Loperfito, I know you, you may not want to throw him against left-handers. Okay, whatever. But at some point, you, you've got to play Loperfito if you're going to bring him up because he needs to play. He needs to prove whether he can be up here or not. It's like yeah. Dana and Espada don't agree on that or something because Dana said, well, we're not going to bring Loperfito up unless he's going to play. And that was kind of his deal. And then Loperfito comes up with the injury to Tucker and they proceed just not to play him, to stick him on the bench. Well, you could have brought anybody up to stick him on the bench. And... Loperfito is making great plays at first base and the Astros are scrubbing it from, you know, Sugarland social media or whatever, because, yeah. you know, it looks yeah. bad on a break. I mean, this is an organ. This to me sounds like, oh, this is, oh yeah, that's what losers do. That's what losers, like they're trying to cover up mistakes left and right. Like we're not going to figure, like they think Astros fans are stupid. Well, I, I guess what I don't understand, Robert, is you're, you're putting a veteran who has struggled way more than, than he should and you're doing that over a kid who has no experience at first base, but the fact that he has played some first in the minors and looks good, why not put him in for one game and see what happens? You know, if if he throws an, if he makes a, a throwing error or you know misses a ball he should have caught and the, and the game ends, okay, you know then maybe you have a right to say that, but at least give the kid a chance to show what he can do. It's it's not like he's going to be any worse than a guy who is struggling in all aspects of his game, not just offensively but defensively. Yeah, yeah, no, it's it's a mess. And, you know, I, I, I kind of said it before, but I've pretty much given up on this year. However, one bright note for the future, Hunter Brown is back to looking like a legit young phenom. In six of his last seven starts, Stephen, he's given up three runs or less, and he's gone six innings in his last four starts, meaning he's keeping the pitch count down a little bit. Well, I tell you, it definitely, it, it couldn't have come at a better time. And with Hunter Brown, you know, you kept wondering, well, he's got to figure it out. He's got to figure it out because he certainly showed flashes when he first came up. So that is good to see. And he's at least taking some of the relief off of the bullpen. And, you know, you talk about him. And I think every start that he's making, Spencer Arigetti is improving more and more as time goes on, too. So, you know, if those two guys can improve each time out, that is obviously great for the Astros pitching staff. And it's also great for the bullpen because it means you're not going to be calling somebody in you know, whether it's a Seth Martinez or a Taylor Scott that much sooner. So yeah, it is definitely great to see Hunter Brown turning it around. You just hope he can keep it up the rest of the year. Yeah. You said Eric Getty's looked good. Three, eight, nine ERA in his last eight starts, which you really, it's just those first two or three starts with him and Hunter Brown that they've kind of got their act together. And if he gets that control, he's a stud also, but Steven, this pitching staff is a mess and it's thanks to, and you and I have talked about it since we talked last time, we knew it right after we talked about it, it came out. <laughs> Arkiti gone for the year. Javier gone for the year. Thanks to the World Baseball Classic and multiple postseasons, Arkiti, Javier, Garcia, all going to miss a season and a half after pitching in that stupid WBC. And I know the WBC is coming to Houston. I'm supposed to be excited about it in two years, but I yeah. hate it, hate it, hate it. Always have hated it, Stephen. Yeah, I'm with you on that, Robert. It just And, you know, for Arkiti, it's unfortunate because this is his second Tommy John surgery. 
in the last, what, five years or so? You know, so for him, it just kind of makes you wonder. I know he's not the only pitcher that's had to, but especially bad for him. But Christian Javier, I mean, we were counting we were counting on him, I think, way more than Jose Arquiti to anchor this Astros pitching staff with Framber Valdez and, you know, with Hunter Brown and Justin Verlander and these guys. And now he's gone for the year. So, And it looked like you had a deal on his contract, too, Christian Javier, with that extension right. and all that. And and then now you basically wipe away two years of that deal on the contract. And maybe you could say wipe away three with how bad he was last year. Yeah. So it is, it's such a blow to the Astro staff. And I know, you know, we're still in here hearing encouraging things about Luis Garcia, you know, throwing batting practice or throwing, you know, that sort of thing. Haven't heard much about Lance McCullers, but it's still going to be a while before these guys get back. The Astros, you know, they can't wait for them to come back to turn things around. They need to do it now. And, you know, you can hope that when they do get back that they can even be effective. And, and that's the question, how effective are they going to be by the time they do, if it's July, August, maybe 1st of September, who knows? So really, they, they just can't be in the conversation. We need to talk about the here and now. And with guys like Hunter Brown and Spencer Arigetti, if they can just keep going, that, that's what really needs to happen if the Astros even have a chance of turning things around. Yeah, just to, something I thought about, Stephen, and I can't remember if we've discussed this much on the show. We've definitely talked about that, you know, John Smoltz came out and said, what's causing these issues with Tommy John and arm surgeries and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. guys trying to throw as hard as they can spin rates, blah, blah, blah. Well, here's the deal. The Astros have been a franchise known for thinking outside the box, going left when everybody goes right. And that's mm -hmm. really the key in any mm -hmm. um, championship kind of thinking and being a billionaire, you got to think left when everybody goes right. You got to think differently. And the, the Astros, Steven, I still think this goes back to, all right, so we're getting all these guys hurt. We're trying speed and spin rate and all that sort of stuff. How about we do something else? Maybe the spin rate, we're not going to change a whole lot, but maybe we change how we look at starting pitchers and try to get them to go longer in the games and encourage our best arms to not throw it as hard as they can every single pitch. Like get, get that as, as the new organizational philosophy, because then if you do that, it's not just that you have less arm trouble, but you have your best pitchers pitching the more valuable innings in a game, as opposed to the guys that are pitching in the sixth or seventh. If you're stuck with a Montero or a Seth Martinez, you would rather have Christian Javier and Framber Valdez and, and those kind of quality pitchers when they were at their best, you know, pitching in those innings. Well, it's a good idea, Robert. I just don't know how you convince a pitcher to not throw so hard especially in this day and age. And I think it also goes back even before Major League Baseball. You know, this starts at the youth level. This starts at college. And, you know, it, it continues on in college. And in the minor leagues, you know, they're, they're trying to develop them. But I think this goes even beyond MLB. And, you know, I've read where, you know, maybe they need to implement some rule changes or at least incentives for teams to try to encourage pitchers to do things, whether it's not throw as hard, not pitches, you know, not pitch as long, whatever it is. To, to keep their arms as fresh as possible for the whole season. You know, you can pitch into the sixth, seventh, eighth inning, but if your arm is going to give out mid-season, that's not going to help. So I, I don't know what, you know, it, it's not something that you can answer right away, but I do know something needs to be done. It just has to. We can't keep going on like this. It's not just the Astros that are having these issues. It's many, just about every team in Major League Baseball, it seems like. And I hate to be like Debbie Downer with this thing, but when I watch Hunter Brown, he throws a very repeatable yeah. motion because we've seen Justin yeah. Verlander do this now for many, many years. So I think he's got a motion that I, I really like. I am scared watching Spencer Arigetti. It reminds mm -hmm. me, it's a little bit more herky-jerky. It reminds me a little bit more of a Lance McCullers where he's getting all this yeah. snap and all this break. And I'm afraid just that that he's going to break you know well see that's where i think i think that's what's killing arms more than anything is just trying to put so much spin time after time after time you know your arm just can't i mean throwing hard can do it too but spinning and moving your arm that way it, it just it can't take it that many times i don't think justin verlander has this crazy spin and break and i think he's made of his career more out of control and, and yeah. the great the great ones tend to do that he he's learned how to manage his and that's obviously why he is still pitching and yeah he's had you know some injury issues in the last few years but that that's just going to come with age but i think he has learned to manage his workload or at least the way he throws his pitches teach the staff 
the Ronell Blanco changeup because I think he's going to have staying yeah. power because he's relying more on changeup than the breaking pitch and the spin. Yeah, I think that he is a good example. And, you know, we were talking about the success of Hunter Brown. I think one of the reasons is he's the sinker that he's throwing has really been effective in his last couple of starts. So, you know, he continues to do that. That may be one of the reasons that he can continue to be effective. But, yeah, his motion and Arigetti, you do kind of worry about that style eventually catching up to him. Did you have any other Astros thoughts before we finish things off? Well, I, I just want, you know, would like to see more Loper Fido playing time. And we keep hearing about some guys in the minor leagues that are, are doing well, but, you know, they're still a ways away. But, you know, we keep hearing about the Astros. Are they going to be sellers? Are they going to be buyers? I, I don't see them being sellers. I really don't at this moment. I think they, they have to be buyers if they even think they want to have a chance at winning the division. So that's just going to be something to keep an eye on for the rest of this month. The other thing the Astros need to start doing is just avoid getting hit by baseballs. Look, well, Vito's back yeah. down in the minor leagues because <laughs> guess what? Yanner Diaz got hit by a base. I mean, there's not much that these guys can do about it. No. I will say this, though, Stephen. I will say this. Bregman's got hit twice in that same hand, yeah. you know, and, and, and has had the contusion and, and missed time and blah, blah, blah. That's a padding thing that you can put there that, you know, with all the Jeff Bagwell talk, I remember Jeff Bagwell had one of those padding right on his, on that same hand. And it might be a good idea for Bregman. It was his, wasn't it his left hand? Uh, yeah. That yeah. Hit? Yeah. And, and if you remember, didn't Bagwell start using that pad after he, cause he got hit on the hand. I want to say it was in 94 during the strike shortened season. And I, I don't know if it was after that, that he started wearing the pad, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it was. So, you know, if anybody would know, it would be Jeff Bagwell. And Biggio used to wear more armor than Earl Campbell at the University yeah, of Texas. He certainly did. <laughs> so that, that makes sense. But yeah, I mean, those are just things that's it's hard to keep from happening. But with Alex Bregman, you know, he had another scare with that too, just the other day. Yeah, I don't know what you could have done with Tucker. I think that hit him in a spot. Well, it was a would... it was a foul ball. It just hit off his I, yeah. I mean, that was there was it, nothing it, you can do about it. It wasn't in a place where you would even, I think, have the usual maybe like maybe if you wore a shin pad, but I don't even think yeah. it, it, where he hit, I don't think it, it, it any of those things would have helped him at all. Yeah, so. that was just a freak thing or something I think is pretty unavoidable. But yeah, these guys are just they're getting hit left and right. They're you're losing time. And it's like every single guy that goes down it seems like a, a big deal, Stephen, because you know, every game it's like, okay, we're one one other one more game away from just Throwing yeah. in the white towel. Well, you know, I mean, the Texans have certainly had years like this where you wake up every day and you're scared to go on X or, you know, look at the headlines to see if another Astros player got injured. You know, if you didn't see the game last night or, you know, if you do, you hold your breath every time something happens because it means, oh, my gosh, another guy's gone down. It, yeah, it does remind <laughs> me of the Texans. It's funny you say that. It does yeah. remind me because it seemed like there was I can't remember which year it was, but there was one year where you would come out of a game and you would think everything's fine. The next day, it's like, well, that guy's out for the year. And it's like, what, what happened? I didn't even see him go out. And you, there was nothing. And it's like with these Astros players, we see them actually get hit, but they stay in the game. And you're thinking, okay, they're going to be fine. And then the next day, they're like, well, I don't think he's going to play. And it's like with Kyle Tucker, now he's out for uh, a series. No, he's out for 10 days now. Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to say it was Deshaun Watson's first year when he got injured. It seemed like there were a rash of injuries that year. And it wasn't very long ago. You know, just a few years ago, the Texans went through that. Well, now it's the Astros' turn. Yeah, at least with the Texans this year, they had all those injuries. But <laughs> you're, you see them actually happen in the game. The guys, ha you know, has to go yeah. up the field and stuff. So. Yeah, and they maintained despite that. I mean, that was the thing about it. All right, we got a really good guest coming up this week. Look for my conversation with David Delotti, who is in sports radio in Houston for 35 years, retired. Oh, yeah. You're going to find out kind of what he's doing right now. But more importantly, he's going to have some really cool stories about his time covering the Astros and the Rockets, the Oilers, and I mean, just a lot of different stuff. I mean, incredible uh, career for Dave. I mean, if you can stay in this business, business, you know this, Stephen, for 35 years in the same market, that's almost impossible. It is almost impossible. And it's a testament. I, I mean, I remember listening to David, I don't know if it was for 35 years, maybe I didn't see him that long, but certainly for many, many years, you know, being in radio myself, it, it's tough to stay in the industry, much less the same market for more than five years, much less 35 Give us a thumbs up. We want to hear from you guys. Comment. Uh, tell us what you think. And, of course, uh, uh, I I'll come back at you. You know I'll come back at you if I think it doesn't work. But I I'm going to You're be not shy. I'm going to be nice to you usually. So, um, But thanks again, everybody, for watching and listening. And we'll talk to you soon. You're listening to Houston Sports Talk. Hey, don't forget to support us by subscribing and commenting on YouTube. You can always listen to us 
on Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast app. Tell your friends about us and share our show links on social media. Spread the word, everybody. Thanks for listening.